Hey everybody, Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories that playing tabletop games with friends and family can create. And in this episode, we will be discussing art in games. How does it help carry the theme of the game, create a mood for a game, or even break or uplift a game? But first, what have we recently played? Nathan, you want to lead us off on this? Yeah, I have a theme to the games I want to talk about that I've played recently. I played a a couple different games with the same theme and they all handled it very differently. And the theme is basically exploring for a temple. So the first one I want to talk about is Kuruba. So in Kuruba, you are searching for a number of temples and it's kind of a puzzle type game where you're laying paths to get to these temples and everybody can kind of follow the same paths but you don't have the same start point. So you, you, when you're laying out a path, you want to try to do it so it's efficient for you, but not efficient for somebody else to use your same path. And you're basically laying these tiles with paths similar to um, Soro. And, but the difference is in order to move along those paths, you have to spend some of the tiles. So you can either play it down to create, extend your path or spend it to move your person. And you have multiple people and the game ends when all your people get to the various temples and so it's basically a puzzle race it's very it feels very solo even though you're all doing it on the same board the interaction is very minimum minimal you can technically block somebody because you can't have two people in the same square but that's pretty rare now Another game that handles the same theme is Tikal. Now, in Tikal, you are archaeologists excavating temples. So you're exploring the jungle, trying to find temples and trying to excavate them. And it's basically an area control game where you, at the various scoring points, you score based, you score only the tiles in which you have the most archaeologists at now this again is done by drawing tiles and you get to place them and then you get to try to spend action points to move your archaeologists around excavate temples to make them worth more points you can put guards on a temple to make sure only you can score it and then you permanently have majority in that temple and it's a nice again it's basically a puzzle uh puzzle game it's not you know, optimization game. There is some randomness in the tile draws, but there is an optional rule where you can actually auction off the tiles. So you, you draw tiles equal to the number of players and you spend income to, or basically spend points to be the first to pick a tile to place. The last one I want to talk about in that theme is probably the most, the lightest and most fun of those titles is called the quest for el dorado and this is just a straight race game it's you have to uh basically have a re gather resources to be able to move along the map and you spend the resources and it's basically uh deck building in that regard so you have cards that have certain resources on them you can some of them give you income that income can be used to buy new cards to add to your deck and basically the first person to get to el dorado wins very fun very easy you can learn this game in about five minutes and teach it to just about anybody it's a very enjoyable game i've played that one a few times so that's what I have been playing. Nice. Yeah. Evan, you're making a nice, excited face. What have you been playing? Ah, so what have I been playing? Um, so uh, one first one I'm going to talk about is I got to play Role Player recently. So it actually has just come out in a digital port uh, for Android and for um, iOS. Um, so I managed to get a 
copy of that and do a, uh, do a couple playthroughs uh, solo through it. It is going to have uh, multiplayer um, across the internet coming soon, but you can play multiplayer uh, with like a pass and play option. And the digital port actually is really clean, really nice. Um, it's a nice manipulation game where you are creating a D&D esque character and you have to equip them with traits and skills and equipment. We've done a playthrough here on the channel and um, I, I really enjoyed the game. So I was excited when I saw that they were doing a digital adaptation for it that was going to be available uh, across, for, for most devices and I'm very happy that it came out very cleanly. So after that, I actually um, recently also got to play a game that I will be talking about as we get into our main subject um, of art, Sagrada. So got to play that, which is also another uh, dice manipulation game. Well, not so much manipulation, dice placement game, uh, as you are a, making a stained glass window and trying to make the most beautiful stained glass window out there as you draft dice with your um, opponents. And art-wise, it is a very beautiful very clean looking game and i was very happy to play that with my wife uh, she enjoyed it very much too so very happy to get that back onto the table again and the last one i'm going to talk about i actually got to play with john and peter here at james's house because we actually do get to play games together once in a great 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 while it takes it takes a while it takes a while in between I think a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah i mean plague plagues have been you know around for a little bit here so it made it hard just don't get to join very often and so sad ah uh, i know because then i don't get to beat you in person <laughs> i'm telling you nathan do you just get a job down here you can move in with james it'd be fine i mean most of his daughters are get at that age. Are going to be moving out, so he'll have some spare room. Yeah, it's the, the net yep. population will remain even. It'll be fine. But I got to play uh, Wonderland Wars with um, you guys, and so with that one, it's a uh, bag manipulation game, um, also with area control. I really enjoyed it. I really like the art style with it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I don't know if either one of you guys are going to talk more about it. I already talked about two games, so I'll leave it to you guys to talk more about it mm -hmm. and I'll pipe in a little bit if you so desire. But I'm going to mention it more once we get into the art section. So that's yeah. kind of why I'm avoiding it right now. Mm. So yeah, how about you, John? What well, you playing with my heart? Up. That what that what's going on here? So that that is a game that I enjoy doing. Mm. Well, uh, I pretty much I played. I think only two games really. Um, one of which was uh, the aforementioned Wonderland Wars. Uh, which uh, who who won that game of it? I can't remember. I, I don't Peter know. Did. I'm not. I don't know. Peter but, did. I, but I'm going to be the annoying person and say it's <laughs> Wonderland's War. Wonderland Wars? Wonderland's War. <laughs> your, your mic keeps breaking up there. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear Wonderland Wars. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there was pretty much that. And uh, I, I believe uh, James beat Heaven by, was it one point for, for third and fourth? It was, uh, yep. Evan's uh, like, nope, not even going to respond to that. Not going to yeah, do it. Even, Can't make me. Especially nope. since I stole two points from Evan to make that happen. I was completely happy to come in at a nice cushy second place. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the other one I played is uh, I played it on uh, TTS. Uh, Lacrimosa, I believe is the name of it. I don't know if you guys have heard of that one. Yeah, that's the, uh, was it Mozart or Beethoven? Yep. Mozart. Mozart right. Yeah, so it's kind of Mozart's dead, and you're trying to build the, you know, construct the last requiem, you know. Um, so it's just kind of you're all, you know, supposed to be, you know, people who knew him, and you're kind of telling stories about him to his, uh, and helping his wife, you know, reconstruct, you know, or finish his last, you know, so, you know, 
um, concerto piece, or I can't remember specifically, but yeah. And you, so it's kind of a little bit of area control and, you know, deck builder. Um, so like the area control is uh, there's different pieces in the five different movements that you need to um, construct and write for. And you basically take one of your tokens for that instrument that you have in your player board, take it there and you get the, um, this, you know, the bonus from it. And there's two different composers and there's five composers total, but every time you play, you pick two of them um, and you play with them and you get different bonuses and their scoring is based on who has, which composer has the most pieces in that movement. And then you get points based on how many of your pieces you have of that composer in that movement. And so that's kind of the area of control there. Plus there's also an area of the movement part. So like the cards have different actions. Uh, one of the actions is to, you know, add to the, uh, to one of the five movements of the, of the uh, piece. You can also, uh, I think um, one of them is just basically like locations and like, um, you know, like opera houses and, you know, different songs that you can have that you can then play to get money later on, or you can sell them. So it's kind of like this whole kind of give and take. There's also in-game cards you get by moving Mozart around on the board. Uh, it's kind of, you know, as you're telling the t tales of what he's done in other places, you'll then get bonuses. And there's three different resources that you're managing as well. So it's there's a lot of like, you know, kind of interesting connecting pieces there that I really liked when I played it. Um, but it's kind of, I would call it a kind of like a, a Tableau engine builder as well. Because you only have uh, nine cards and you'll see all nine cards every round. There's five different rounds or ages as they called them. And you'll just... Uh, You'll play one for the action and then one for resource that you'll get at the end of the round. So it's kind of like a, a toss up. Uh, and one of the actions you can do is basically gets cards that replaces cards in your deck. And the card you replace is the resource card. And so all the newer cards that you get have nicer resources. So it's always going to be an upgrade. But you also kind of have to be careful. You don't throw away like all your actions to do you know, movement or something like that. And then you're stuck without being able to move Mozart. Nice. It, it, that's, that's, that's one that I swear, the more I get into the hobby and the more games that I hear about, there are so many games built on things that I never would have imagined a game touching on. And music like that is just, that's nothing I've ever played before. And it just, again, it, like amazes me that somebody out there thought, okay, I can make a game out of this. Yep. Based kind of on the idea of, you know, the end of Mozart's life and people retelling the, you know, the crazy stories of him. Yep. And, the, and, you know, the art, you know, I mean, we can get into that later, or whatever, mm -hmm. but, you know, the art of it is, you know, looks, you know, of that period. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I guess that just leaves, uh, just leaves me um november has been a was a bit of a game playing month for me i feel like sometimes we get to this segment of the of the episode i'm like ah, i've maybe played one game recently um but i was just kind of taking a look and tallying it up and i think i played like seven different games uh this month i'm gonna narrow it down to just three you go, um, Peter. I know. I was very, I was very happy about that. It, I, and it was a lot of, lot of new games for me. Um, I think of all of those seven, only one of them, yeah, only one of them was a, was a repeat of game of a game that I've played previously. Um, so the the most recent game that I played is a game called In Between, um, and this is a, it's a, been around for a few years, but it's a two player tug of war. And if you are into uh, fantasy and or stranger things, this is a game that would possibly be thematically up your alley. Um, one person is playing as the town and the other player is the creature who is invading the town trying to gobble up all of its uh, inhabitants. Um, the, the board, the, the, the way it lays out on the table is that there are uh, character cards 
10 of them laid out in a circle. And all character cards are double sided, uh, showing which dimension they are currently living in. Are they living in the mo the regular world dimension or are they in the creatures dimension? Um, if neither of the if neither of the players has uh, like cube a cube on that character card, then the character is said to be living in between. They are currently not dominated by one dimension or the other. And uh, both the uh, the creature and the uh, village, the town, when they it's their turn, they're going to be playing a card that is going to have some symbols on it. And the symbol that is on it can correspond to symbols that are on some of the character cards, allowing them to influence that character. Um, the more times they influence them, they're dragging them further into their dimension, either to safety in the regular world or into peril in the creature's world. Um, and there are four different win conditions. If uh, the creature can get three characters all the way to the devoured stage, um, three characters to the devoured stage before the, the player character, uh, before the village character does, then the creature could win and vice versa. If the town person can get them all the way to the safe and they get three of them, then they're good. Uh, the other win condition is there are some um, there are some characters who have the ability to remove character cards from the game. And if at any point in time you get down to only five character cards left in the game, then whichever person has the most in their dimension wins. Uh, and then the other one is awareness. There's an awareness track that each player has. And if the first person who can get their awareness tracker to six uh, will win. And the way that you do that is having, having, again, more people in your dimension that are being influenced by you, as well as spending uh, energy. These are little cubes that you acc accrue throughout the game. You spend energy to upgrade your awareness. Uh, and the higher your awareness gets, uh, everybody, each person has one time that they can spend their awareness power. And the higher your awareness gets before you spend it, uh, the better the power can be. So, or the more options you have. So if you like Stranger Things, again, if you like two-player tug of wars, then this might be a game that you would enjoy. Um, I, I've only played it the one time. I liked it. I didn't love it. Uh, I wanted to love it more. Uh, but I plan on playing it again very soon so that I can uh, get a better feel for the game. Um, the other game that I played very recently, again, I kind of went with a theme here the, of the ones I'm going to talk about, is another two-player tug of war. And this one is phenomenal. And it fires on all cylinders from the get-go. And that is Watergate, where one person is playing as uh, the newspaper that is investigating... Um, Richard Nixon's uh, presidential group. And then the other one is playing as Nixon. And you're going to be playing cards. Again, same thing, kind of like what I was talking about in, in between. You're playing cards that cause these things to happen. Uh, and you're trying to, if you're Nixon, you're trying to block the paper from getting access to individuals who can cooperate stories. Um, and if you're the paper, you're trying to connect two individuals back to the Nixon presidential uh, group. So uh, it's that one, like just from the moment you start playing is steeped in some really cool history. And the theme is just really perfect. And it feels very tight the whole way through. Uh, whereas with my one playthrough of in between, it probably took a good 20 to 30 minutes before I actually felt any of that tension um, that I kind of love from those tug of war games. So we'll see another playthrough of in between. I'm hoping will show that uh, maybe that was just because of it was the first playthrough. And then the other one that I did was another two player that is one of my all-time favorites, and I've mentioned it multiple times on the show before, so I won't go into too great a detail, but that is Seven Wonders Duel. Um, and uh, it's it's for me, it is a go-to to teach new people who are getting into the hobby 
um, some games. It's it's not super complex, but it's just complex enough that I think to be really interesting. Um, and so I, I had a new I had a friend who was had never really played a lot of games, but said he was interested in checking some out. And so I immediately brought Seven Wonders Duel uh, as it is just a fantastic two player game. Uh, so in that one, you're just you're trying to be the first one to build all of your four wonders, hopefully to stop the other person from being able to build their four, keep them just at three. Uh, you're also building up your um, your city to be the best city with the most resources and the coolest buildings. And you want a lot of victory points. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's really good. It's got some good, uh, good gotcha mechanics where you can stop the other person from building the resources that they need, making it more expensive for them to build things. Um, and you can win multiple ways by either getting the most victory points or deciding to go the science route and win there or go warfare and win with warfare. And Seven Wonders Duel, I've played it a good probably 20 times or so at this point, which is very high for me for, for games. Um, and every time I, I find it to be very enjoyable. So those are the three that I was going to mention for my recently played. So I have a question. I, Does the yeah. title for in between bother you? No. Cause they put it as one word. Yep. In between. Technically <laughs> as misspelling of the word. Absolutely. doesn't bother me a bit. And I'm a librarian, so who cares? <laughs> it's an artistic choice. Yeah, an Look artistic how we choice. Segue. Yep. yep, yep. And speaking of that, it's a really cool box where the front of the box shows like the the regular side of the world, and then you flip it over on the back side of the box, it shows the creatures dimension, and all of the text for that you normally would find on the front or the back of the box is actually just around the edge of the box. Which, uh, which I've I've heard some people didn't love, but I think it's actually a pretty cool artistic choice that is selling again a theme of the game. So yeah, let's we'll segue right on in with that. Okay, if we're gonna go sh straight into art, I kind of thought we should talk about how art and board gaming has changed over the years because you know I'm I've considered myself relatively recently getting into board games it's really been only the last 10 or so years that i've been into board games heavily and even in that time i've seen a major shift you know when i was first starting and anything before that you know a lot of the games didn't necessarily look great now there's definitely seems to be a major focus on art and presentation and you know selling the game by making it look appealing I mean, I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was yeah. going to say, you've you've been in, you've been in, you said, relatively recent, and it's been about 10 years or so. I mean, you got someone like me who it's been maybe three years, two and a half, three years, really, that I've been finally diving into or back into the hobby. Um, and I, I, I think that there are so many really beautiful looking games, and I'm with you. A lot of it probably is... Um, a lot of it is the appeal, like you're, you know, you're trying to make it nice looking so that people want to pick it up and take it home. Um, but you do look at a lot of the older games, um, and I don't know if it's just a change in style or if it's, I mean, because obviously art is art and art has been around for a very long time and there's beautiful works of art that were painted, you know, centuries ago. Well, it's, I think it's also kind of like a lot of access to, you know, like more cost effective printing, maybe, or okay. at least kind of cheaper. Because, I mean, if you go and take a look at games like uh, Nuclear War, like those cards are basic. Uh, I don't know if you guys have played Nuclear War before. I am guess I know Evan has. I have. I have not played Nuclear War. It's a game where you can die before it begins. Okay. Like you die in setup. Yep. <laughs> and then I've, I've heard of games like else. that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's I mean, it's kind of part of the appeal, you know, it's it is a very basic game, but I mean, it was oh, I'm trying to think when was it even originally came out? Do you remember? I mean, I mean I'm thinking it's got to be like 70s or maybe later. So I was I was going to say early 80s would be my my guess off the top maybe. of my head. 
Uh, yeah, Table, uh, BGG 80s, yeah. says 1965. Ah, yeah. Shouldn't have doubted myself. I was thinking 70s, maybe later. And so, yeah. Yep, 65. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah, especially a lot of the cards are just, you know, numbers printed on cardstock, basically. Um, you know, so I mean, at the time, there was not a whole lot of, you know, like game, especially if there's a game that wasn't on a Monopoly style board. I mean, mm -hmm. so many games were just pushed in that direction. It didn't need to be, you know, and like I'm just kind of thinking of like, uh, you know, careers or, you know, like, like there's like some other games, you know, like old ones like that. Uh, there was, but you get a few of them that were at least kind of interesting in how they tried to present themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm remembering this, like, it was actually fun to play. It was like this car dealership, used car dealership game uh, that uh, an old friend of mine had that she picked up from some like, uh, gr you know, like uh, whatever, uh, like Goodwill kind of place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just like, it was a turnstile. You know, so basically all the cards were like presented on that. I mean, it's been a long time since I played it, but yeah, all the cards on there were basically cardstock, you know. So you think you think a good reason why it may have gotten better is just easier access to uh, printing and yeah. and manufacturing of the pieces and and the cost has gone way down. And then I wonder how much of it is also just uh more access to to better artists like to, but, like very it's it seems like it's much with the interconnectedness that we have today um through the internet and through uh, through other social media type things how much easier is it now to put out a call for people who are looking to either step up their their resume for art or people who are already very established um, but now you can actually find them easier i mean it's it's no longer trying to pull out a Rolodex and, and, and call up and be like, ah, who do I even know who does art where today you, you can't, you can't jump onto social media without stumbling over tons of people who do art uh, and love games. So. Yeah. And that was actually the point that I was going to bring up was um, yeah. You're looking at games in the formation of when they started to get popular, you go 60, 70s and you look at the games in that, that style, in that era you had games like Monopoly or Life or Risk Clue where they had okay art on the box. And that's where the art ended because there was nothing that was into it. And I think part of the issue was if you were a game designer, how are you convincing an artist to make art beyond the box and put it into a game? And I think that is such a hard sell because you're thinking it, it's a game. What am I going to get out of this being the artist making the art for this? When I'm not creating this art, I think, you know, putting it in our box is the easier sell. So if we could put it on that, at least we have something. Now that had changed as games got more and more expansive, I feel. That's why we were able to put it more into it. You know, I, I think that's kind of one thing that may have happened. I don't know. I mean, looking at it, it's... I think it might be more than that. It's, you know, you also have like the competitive space. You need to differentiate yourself is one thing nowadays because there's just so much more. But another bigger thing is, I mean, it's just looking at it as a cost analysis thing. Like if you're going to pay for some for art and for like good UI design artists and all kinds of other things that may, you know, might not have gotten as much attention, but that still would have been a front loaded cost and taking a look at how big of the market there was there, how likely were you to, you know, get back those costs? I mean, I would say that's probably, you know, a huge factor there. Yeah. I mean, totally. There's volume is a definitely a big seller. The volume is definitely increased. The number of people buying your games has increased. Yes. And, you know, Peter's point, accessibility to, you know, higher quality printing is definitely increased and as peter uh as evan said there are so many or not evan uh 
John said, uh, there are so many more games, so you do have to stand out. You have to sell your game a lot more than you used to. It used to be you people just took what was available because they didn't have many choices unless they're going to import from overseas. But the other big impact, I believe, is Kickstarter. And Kickstarter, you have to visually sell your game because people don't have a chance to play it before they buy it. You can't rely on word of mouth people saying this is a great game necessarily because, again, most other than reviewers, people haven't played this game. And, you know, we can say, okay, you know, if you want to find out if a game is good, you know, go to a reviewer. But most people really only go and look at a reviewer and what they think of a game after the game's caught their attention. So the art is really important for getting them just even to look into the game yeah i mean even at a game show i mean if like i don't find the art enticing at all um i'm a lot less inclined to go and you know even like take a look at the game because you know if it's just you know looks like uh you know you cobbled together you know in five seconds you know it's i don't know it feels like that's the kind of like if you're there you should be, you know, presenting your best face. Yeah, and I, I think an extension to that too is um, along with Kickstarter now with like TTS out there, you have to have the art and you have to show it out there. It, it's not just about the gameplay anymore. You, you have to have the visual aspect completely because there's probably hundreds of games out there on TTS at super basic levels that nobody ever plays because everything's all blocks and very basic cards as they're trying to figure it out and it, it may not go ever beyond that you got to have the art in order to sell the games because we're very much visually looking at these things and we're interacting with them before we're getting physical copies of it so we want to see what am i getting why am i paying a hundred dollars for this game now i have it i can see it this is why plus it helps bring the, like the theme together i mean you know, it is really nice when you kind of get everything hits all cylinders, you know, the art, you know, invokes the theme, the setting, the time period, you know, what have you, and it brings it in with the mechanics, you know, it kind of then gets into the whole, you know, uh, I guess for lack of, you know, UI design, you know, like where you're kind of trying to give information clearly, you know, and not have to have, you know, you know text dumps every time you want to go and try and figure out what something does and art is su it's such a huge thing I'm, I'm looking over at my game shelf here just to my left and just on the couple games that i can see just on the cover like it's put right there right next to like game design like art by um it's gotten to the point that it is now a driving factor into these games people are following certain artists certain styles and this is what we want so we're going to put that right onto the cover because as much as we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, Peter, we do very much so. I was going to say, man, there's something about a book cover that that's going to sell it no matter how many, how much that is a known saying, a good book cover, even a very like classic, just kind of clean book cover that doesn't have a huge, it, the, the design, the graphic design of a book cover can sell it so easily. Uh, I well, want to talk more about graphic design, but before we get to that, I kind of want to talk more about, yes, keep going along with the marketing and, and for a little longer. And, you know, Evan mentioned, you know, the move from box covers to actually integrated art. And I think a lot of that is the growth of conventions because, you know, box cover just sells it on the shelf. But at a convention, you need something with table presence. You need mm -hmm. to have somebody see this game, want to try it, talk about it with other people. And that is a huge way for a lot of designers to sell their games. Actually, just getting it onto the, the shelves a lot of times. So you get they do you know they get the prototypes, they bring it to these conventions, and they attract store owners and publishers this way. I mean, to me, it also shows that. You know, you're paying attention to the details. You know, it's it's more than, you know, just, you know, that 
having something looks pretty, but I mean, if, if it looks, you know, like you're, you know, uh, just kind of presenting your best self, I guess, you know, you just, I mean, it's all kind of, you know, it, if you weren't even paying attention to that at all, I mean, you know, what else did you ignore in the whole game design? And part of it too is um, speaking, you know, along with what um, Nathan said. So if you're, you, you need to have that table presence. You need to be able to draw a person in by the visual look by it sitting there. You're always going to have somebody that, you know, is actively going to be like, oh, that looks interesting. But where your key selling point to get people interested in it is, can I grab the attention of a person that's walking by in five seconds that isn't necessarily paying attention? If you can do that, then you have a good, good job with your art or your good job with your components. Something is drawing that in, and that's where you're going to you know, make the money with that game. Yeah, I mean, you can't underestimate a good mini you know drawing you in oh absolutely good, good miniatures i mean a good layout of a map that integrates the art very well something is something something that is catching your eye you know from that distance that makes you just go whoa what's that i mean i won't lie custom meeples you know often it's like you know what you're giving it a little bit extra character and a little bit extra care you know it's like all right, I'll, I'll I'll take a look. I mean, it, it, for someone like me, it, it it's a little harder because, like, I coming from playing so many miniature games and going some of that appeal, I, I can walk by some you know very fantastic builds. It, it's just there, it's hard to for me to pin down exactly what it is to catch my eye, and you know, for every person, it's going to be different. And I think that's a, a very hard aspect. There's never going to be that one magical, this is it, that's going to appeal to everybody. So you need to figure out a way that you can appeal to the mass so quickly. And I, that's why we hear and see a random game out of nowhere all of a sudden hit a million dollars on Kickstarter. Now, to some degree, the ever we're starting to see the reverse of that happening as well, where because there's so much out there so much with amazing art out there and we're starting to get more informed customers you're there's a certain amount of people hesitating if the art is too good and or if their components are too nice thinking oh because you have to stop and think okay is this actually good part of the game or is this just a gimmick that they're throwing in just to trick us into buying it so yeah, they, there is kind of a line, and it's really hard to find that line of, you know, how much do we really want to put into the production, and how much is, at what point do we hit overproduction, and then we're scaring away customers. I mean, for me, I mean, I don't play a game unless I've, you know, I don't buy a game unless I've played it. I mean, that's just kind of like my own personal, you know, preference, because, I mean, I've, I've made a few, you know, where I trusted the designer or whatever on something. And then it just kind of got a stinker. And I'm just kind of like, you know what, until I've played it or at least I've seen it demoed, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I hold back. So I don't do too many Kickstarters for pretty much that reason. I'm the complete opposite. I, I have bought <laughs> and sold games that I have never even opened. It, it just, if, if it has that factor, if it has that look and it catches my attention, I'll give it a shot. Evan, Evan's uh, drawn to the shiny. Oh, yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, but, I mean, there, there are times that it can get to an overproducted feel that it will turn me away from it. And one game that actually James just talked about um, as we were all discussing that he got for his birthday here not that long ago, uh, Lords of Hellas. So that game looked phenomenal. And I was on board with it when it first was released on, um, on the starter. And then they kept on revealing more and more and more with it. And as I was watching it go, something about it said, it's not for me because the core game, as they added more to it, 
completely changed in a change in a direction that I didn't like it to. So that's why I kind of went away with it. Towards Hellas. Why does that sound familiar? It's Awaken Realms. It came out probably like three or four years ago. I think I, think I it's might have like a con promo for it. Is that like a was there like Minotaurs with like yeah, I'm pretty yeah. certain I had like a miniature promo for that. Yeah, and like the basic gameplay looked really good, but like then they started at like it was supposed to be like area control and the theme was really cool, but then it was like, well, you can also win by doing this completely opposite from area control, or this way completely opposite from area control, or you can go and fight these epic, you know, bosses which is completely different from these other ways. Like it just kept on piling more and more like way different from what it was. And I just, that's what turned me off on it. The game looks great, but it wasn't for me. And I, I felt it just, to me, it got to that overproduced point. If you're not familiar with it, it's also sort of a re implementation of Lords of Ragnarok, which I think is a little bit more known. Yeah, I don't think I've played that one either. Which well, don't they have another one coming out like really soon? Lords of something. Mm. Maybe. And did I make that up in my mind? You may have. I'm not sure. Maybe you're thinking Lords of Waterdeep. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I didn't have any grizzly brain damage recently. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not make that uh, mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's hard. I get, magic. I, I, I get so much Kickstarter news anymore, uh, you know, and I bring a lot of it to our Discord stuff. And sometimes it blends together after a bit. Yeah. I mean, we got Heroes of Might and Magic 3 that's on Kickstarter right now. I think it's just ending, if not just ended. Yeah, that's one of those I, ones I'm suspicious of. I, I'm suspicious of because pretty much anything Heroes of Might and Magic 3 and past it was questionable from what I remember. Just just from the PC games, because I, I felt like Heroes of Might and Magic 3 was the peak. Mm. But also... A lot of those IP video uh, video game based board games haven't been great. Um, and yeah, that the designer for, uh, publisher rather that's doing that has been involved with a lot of those that haven't been great. Have been a little clunky and not the best designs, from my yeah. understanding. I haven't actually played any of them myself, so I kind of speaking uh, out of never mind. <laughs> But, but which I, ones? I'm curious now. Well, you, using that as a segue, though, IP games, though, art wise, are usually very nice. Um, you get some of them that use stills from, you know, movies or, you know, uh, from actual gameplay, which can be really nice. But a lot of times they do integrate really awesome miniatures. So, one great way to bring your art up in a game is to put fantastic pieces such as miniatures if you can get a good sculptor or two in there you can put out um some really cool things one um cool game that i got oh and i can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head but it is it'll come to me but it's 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 a tower defense game but the mechanics are not that great the rule book is not really well written out but the miniatures are phenomenal absolutely phenomenal and um, that's the only redeeming factor for the game. Uh, so getting to the to, to art um, and maybe like helping to carry the theme of the game. So have you guys ever played a game that you felt like to remove the art would just ruin the game because the art so much helps to sell the uh, that that theme that you're playing in? Has anybody ever had that experience with a specific game? Um, well, I have one to talk about and one that I've unboxed and I'm hoping is going to be like that. Okay. Uh, 
the one that I've just un did an unboxing of that should be hopefully going up on the channel relatively soon is Etherfields. Now, this has some of the most, my favorite art I've ever seen in the board game. And my absolute favorite mini I've ever seen in the board game. It is definitely a darker theme because it has to do with dreams and nightmares and such. But, you know, that is the theme and the art really sells, seems to sell that theme. So I'm hoping I really enjoy this game. It really looks awesome. But as far as the one I have played that I think really is sold by the art in many ways is Mansions of Madness. And I'm including also the app in the art because their music, the mm. ambient noise, all the sound design elements really help to sell that game and really immerse you in it. It's a game that, yeah, it's usually 90 minutes, sometimes up to three hours, but it feels like 30, <laughs> if that. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think you, and you made a really good point there, is like a lot of the time, even just thinking about this discussion ahead of time, um, when I think, when I say the word art, so much I think of just the visual, the pictures, the illustrations, but it doesn't end there. You guys have made some really good points, uh, Evan talking about miniatures and sculpts that that are in there, and now Nathan talking about the uh, the ambient music that can come in with a game that has an app related to it. Uh, there's a lot of different fields of art that are taking place in board games beyond just the illustrations that maybe somebody has done. Um, and so I, th I think that's something that originally when we started talking about this topic, I hadn't really thought of myself. I was mostly focused on just the, the visual illustrations as art, but there's a lot of different types of art that are that are being implemented in the making of a game. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one specifically, Nathan, um, the illustrations are for me, the illustrations are okay. They're good. But also when you throw in the music that you get involved in there, um, I think that that really, especially the, the music, all of a sudden you're immersed in the creepiness that is the Cthulhu-esque, uh, you know, world and, it just, it really sells it a lot. Um, so I, I like that one a lot specifically for that. The app is so much, so much fun. So good, very well done. Um, I was very impressed with it. It was, it was the, I think one of the, I think it was the first app game or app driven game that I ever played. Um, and I've been spoiled by it because it's really, really good. Um, and there's other great ones out there, but it was the first one for me, so. I think it's the first one for many people because mm -hmm. even though apps exist, app-driven games exist before this, this was the one that really brought it to the forefront and brought it to a lot of people's attention. And, you know, it can, a lot of the games that did it afterwards can kind of be seen as kind of following up on this right. success of this game. But it's so cool because you have the, you have the visual art of the actual game in front of you, but then you also have the art on the app. Um and then the music and the way it all interacts together to make a cohesive whole um, is yeah. really, really cool. Wasn't there like an Arkham style game that did it before? And I think there was also XCOM too, right? Had like the app. XCOM had an app, but it was more driving a timer, essentially. It was trying to make you rush and, you know, yeah. hur hurry and kind of get stressed and make mistakes because you're timed. Uh, so I, I was going to say, I think one of the games that I've played that I feel like the art is, is beautiful and really sells uh, a theme. And again, I was, I was thinking very focused on um, the visual art and that is uh, Takedo. Mm -hmm. which is 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 not a you know not a new game it's been around for a while um but the art that is on that game is i think absolutely beautiful on the board um on the cover all of it um and i'm trying to remember uh Xavier Xavier Duran uh, i wanted to look it up that is the the artist for that game 
and I absolutely love that game. And they just within I can't remember maybe a year or so ago they came out with the um, the digital adaptation for it, and even the digital adaptation for Takedo is so good. And they they did a great job of taking that art and turning it into this video game slash game board game um, that is very interactive and fun to watch uh, as you play it. So that that's one that's one game that as I played it, I like the game. I like the mechanics. It's it's very basic. It it's fine. I know Nathan is a bit more of an elitist when it comes to board games. Takedo is a good introductory game. There's nothing wrong with the game at all. It's a good, solid mechanic game, um, especially for someone getting introduced to board games. Um, and it has beautiful art. I'll agree yeah. it looks nice. Okay. Well, I mean, he's also the same artist, I think, for uh, Seasons. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah, I'm thinking Seasons look here. I like. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I'm just kind of looking through it right now. It looks like he did seasons. Um, so I mean, yeah, that, that one's another one of those games that looks beautiful. You know, that I mean, that's like one of the things that brought me in for that one mm -hmm. originally. Nice. Um, but I mean, I was thinking of a game that, you know, without the art is not a game at all. You know? Oh, okay. And I mean, that's Mysterium. Like the art is oh. a huge, it's like integral. Mm -hmm. absolutely you can't you can't play that game without it yeah <laughs> so, that's no that's a really good way to look at it as well i hadn't even thought about that one but yeah you take away the art and you have no game <laughs> yeah i mean it sells the whole idea of like sending crazy dream visions you know i mean mm -hmm. a guy wearing you know an opera mask on a train flying through space you know i mean right yeah, yeah, you take yeah, you take away the art from that game and you literally have no game left. So that's really that's a really cool example of a, of of a game that, you know, you have to have it. Uh there's another like incredibly simple game mm -hmm. that without the art, it's still kind of a game but nobody would probably ever play it. Soro. When I first opened that, this mm. is a really actually nice looking box, really well presented. It's like you it was, I actually vividly remember the first time I unboxed this game because you open it up and the first thing you see is a transparent page with the art and you lift that up and there's the actual full color art underneath that. And, you know, the board itself has a very good color palette and very well laid out and lots of really nice art. But the game is basically... You're laying down paths and following the paths. It's a super, super simple path, mm -hmm. uh, a pathfinding game, but it looks phenomenal. And I play it anytime anybody asks, but that's mostly because I just love the way it looks that much that it sells it for me. That's cool. Evan's been quiet. <laughs> yeah. Any game that you had thought of, like without the art, it just kind of falls apart. So uh, yeah, I was I was actually thinking about that when I was uh, thinking of something else too. But um, one is actually one that I mentioned earlier in in the show. Uh, stuff that I played would be um, Sagrada. If you remove the art style of you know the stained glass and you part of the game is as you're placing the die, you're using these nice colorful translucent die to mimic these pieces of glass that you're putting in there. If you remove that, the game is dull and lifeless uh, it just it you need to have that art you have to have the color to really drive the game that's what really drives the aesthetic to it it makes it at least playable i i think so what, what about a what about a game and i know we've kind of touched on this a little bit but a game where the art just like lifts it up to the next level or just destroys the game i got a good example of a game that was Pretty much destroyed by the art. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Palenque. This is a game that you could, if you can find this game, it's usually five dollars or less. It's a really interesting, somewhat abstract strategy game. It is Aztec theme. 
uh, but basically you are trying to section off parts of the map and trying to score points, I believe, if I remember, I played it a long time ago, but basically scoring points by you know, controlling sections of the map and trying to make sure you have majority and coordinate it off so that you know where they other people have pieces isn't included and you know sex it's a really kind of interesting strategy game but it's one of the ugliest games i've ever played and that's why you can get it for almost nothing and i played some ugly games <laughs> i was gonna say that you should have a good one what's that one that you mentioned a couple different times that is just like the ugliest multi shades of green oh there's been a few uh <laughs> Um, time and space is probably the one you're thinking of yeah that, that that's a really fun real-time game that i would normally hate but it somehow pulls it off and it's just the ugliest cover you'll ever see the actual game itself is not too bad but the cover is hideous all right i've, I've got one the art on this is rough all right <laughs> and i only know about this game because i got it for free i won it at bgg uh con like i can't even remember how many years ago thing is though if you go and look this one up i believe the uh you might recognize one of the game designers names on it and that game is time pirates all right, this game is actually pretty is this fun. Airplane? Nope. No. Oh, no. Go ahead and take a look at you, you might recognize one of the two of the names on there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan. I mean, the game is actually pretty fun, but if you go off by the art on that one, if you're looking at that box art, who boy, it looks like somebody just learned how to, you know, like photoshop in the 90s you know <laughs> I, I think i might be giving it too much credit with that that's not even a photoshop that's bad clip art yeah it's bad yep uh it is it is definitely the art on it does not do its service but the game is actually halfway decent to play like i mean i won it and so there were like was like well we got it we might as well play it i mean what else are we going to be doing here you know we played that one and then we went and checked no respect out of the you know out and played it too which that one is also way better than it deserves to be especially when you know the box art is just rodney dangerfield <laughs> i i i think that beats palenque as far as ugliness <laughs> so uh i'm going to talk about a game that i think the for me anyways the art lifts it up to the next level and for me a game that I really, really loved when it first came out. And again, it kind of came out close to the time that I was getting back into the hobby. Um, but I've cooled on it a little bit. I don't get it out to the table nearly as often. But at the same time, I don't think I could, I don't know that I could ever bring myself to get rid of the game because I think it's so pretty to look at. And when I do play it, I enjoy playing it because of the art. Um, and for me, that is Wingspan. The game itself uh, is, is a good game. It's well-designed. It's not my favorite game to play. It, uh, it's a little bit more sedate, which is not a bad thing, I guess. Uh, there, there are times that like that fits my mood. Um, but over time, I just don't haven't enjoyed it as much, probably for about a year or more at this point. But I love the art in this game. The, the birds are beautiful. The player boards are pretty. Um, every time they come out with an expansion, I, mean, I know they came out with the new player boards. There's just a lot to be said for the art in this game um, that really just makes it fantastic. Um, and so again, for me anyways, uh, I, I, you know, I took the time to look up the, the name of the artist for this. There's uh, Natalia Rojas, Ana Maria Martinez Jaramillo. I'm going to screw that one up. And then Beth Sobel. Beth Sobel, who has definitely been making a name uh, for, her, for themselves uh, with a bunch of other games recently also. Um, but it's just like this culmination of all this 
really, really beautiful art, uh, natural world art um, that takes a game that for me is now just an okay game, but makes it a game that I don't mind playing or going back to um, because I get to enjoy the art every time I have it out at the table. Well, I would say this is a better than okay game. I, I do really enjoy this game, but I mean, I can I can see where, you know, this is definitely it's, on the lighter end. It's kind of a weird spot where it's it feels like a lighter game, but it, it can actually be difficult for new players. Oh yeah, yeah. It's I think for me, I think for me, I've cooled on it a little bit because I have. I think I prefer. I know that I now prefer games that are more um, interactive between the players. And this is a game where everybody is puzzling out their own their own puzzle. There's a not multiplayer sol a solitaire. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. So it's not that it's not a good game. It's just for me, that style of game is not my preferred style anymore. Like I've I have found the games that I like more. Uh, and so but again, I will go back and play this multiplayer solitaire game because it's so pretty. I, and if you play with Peter, you will be put in such a calm and relaxed state. It is just <laughs> yes. good for your soul. Right. It has an interesting app too, but I would never actually use the app during the game while I'm playing the game. No, it slows it down. I tried using it in the game. It slows it down way too much. <laughs> the app basically, you, you can scan the cards and it'll play the sounds that the bird would make. Yeah, it plays the bird calls and you just have to like use your camera to look at the card it's so great but i'm with you it, it slows it way down too much though that is a good example of it's a pure gimmick there's no functionality for that app in the game it's nothing but it's such a great one yep absolutely i love that somebody put that together yeah that, that, that goes kind of into that you know the whole paying attention to the small details just doing something that's not entirely necessary but you know what it's there if you want it i love that uh, moving on, I, the, and actually, I think Wingspan is possibly a pretty good example of this. And I wanted to talk about, to go back to graphic design and how the art and graphic design help to make a cohesive game and make, it is really important that the art, getting that balance where the art adds the game, but doesn't distract from the mechanics or in, in the best examples, actually helps to enforce, reinforce those mechanics and can actually be used to help you teach and learn the game. And that often ties into theme, selling the theme and the, uh, you know, the theme and the mechanics being, if the theme and the mechanics work well together, that art can help you understand the mechanics. Oh yeah, I, I think one that you, you taught us, Nathan, that does a really good job is Arc Nova. So um, most of the artwork in the game on the cards is showing the animals in there and you can correspond, you know, the size of the animal based off, you know, what, where, where does this need to go? Does it need to go with size one, two, three, four pen based off, you know, how big it is, but like they use great art, great pictures for that, but it doesn't distract from the overall what you're doing with this game. So yeah, the, the opposite example of that would be, um, Oh, what's the name of the game? The Viking game. Oh, that's, there's so really many Viking games dark, that we. Dark yeah, board. Uh, ah, I, I'll have to cut it out because I can't remember the name of the game. It didn't stop uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should be right here. Fire and axe. There it is. Uh, so this is a game. It looks really nice. It's a great game, but the board and art is very dark. And actually, for some, some people have troubles seeing what's going on because of the darker colors. And it's just not that well graphically designed and not easy to learn just because of the art. You know, I, one that I have that, uh, like, at least from the, you know, graphic design standpoint really helps out it's a furnace i don't know if you guys have played that one but the icons on that one and you know kind of other than just you know invoking the air you know the idea of the uh you know like the feeling of the you know industrial revolution era but you know 
you know what every card does by looking at it. There's, you know, zero, you know, like, oh, hey, what does this mean? Like looking it up in the rule book. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, you just kind of learn what the couple of the icons are. You know, it's like, oh, this is this, you know, this is the color for these resources. And, you know, that, that that's you're done. Yeah, I was going to actually talk about that, too, and talk about when we did our holiday buy feet game um, segment, one that you talked about, Peter, with iconography being 100 percent spot on. Sushi Go is a perfect example of you don't need to do a lot, but just that little bit makes the game just much better mm -hmm. it's so much easier yeah absolutely the iconography is perfect for that game yeah perfect iconography super cute like cutesy art on all the cards um like i feel like that one kind of hits the sweet spot for it being a family game um kind of you can bring in some younger a younger group to this game uh and they're going to get sold they're going to get sold on the art and then they're going to enjoy a fun, just a fun set collecting, drafting card game. So it's nice. That it's a game that you have to look at the rule book all of a minute and then play. Right. Absolutely. Very, very well designed. So I'm just going to throw this one out there just real quick. Just um, first game, first game that I loved the art so much. I had to go buy card sleeves for the first time because I didn't want the cards to ever get messed up because they're so pretty. And Pokemon. that is, and that's actually the uh, unmatched. The unmatched series of games has uh, the artist, I believe is Oliver Barrett and the, the backs of each individual characters cards all have really cool designs on them, but then each of the cards themselves then uh, have like different, you know, they've got names on them and then the card art for them is so fun and cool. Um, fun, great, great miniatures included in the game. I, you know, they're not like, um, they're not like the most amazing miniatures in the world, but they're good miniatures. Um, and then decent art on the, on the boards, the boards, the board art isn't like what sells it for me for sure. Uh, it's okay but the card art is just for me the style I really really loved and so I immediately was like okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna go out now buy card sleeves and sleeve my cards um, which I had just again never really worried too much about before that um, so unmatched for me is a is a fun two to possibly four player game um Upon tons of 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 play, it's not my favorite game, but it's fun. I like it. Um, but man, is that the card art is just gorgeous. And so every it's one of those games that now like I'm like I always I want the next character. Um, I've slowed down my purchasing of it because they just keep coming out with so many sets at this point. Um, but yeah. I was about to say, didn't they just come out with a bunch of Marvel ones? I they, think I remember yep. that being at the Origins. Yep, they've got some Marvel RP IPs, and so they got a bunch of those. Uh, they've got Jurassic Park at this point. Um, they've got some, you know, they, I think they have maybe two individual set, uh, individual boxes. So there's one for like Bruce Lee and one for Deadpool. Um, but there's just so many different ones. But it started off as a as an IP free game they were just pulling people who were in the open open market pretty much uh and just some really great art each one each one's deck leans into the character somewhat in some way or form or fashion bruce lee's deck is really really cool looking um sitting there it's like you're watching a martial arts film flipping through the cards there um so really really great art i enjoy it quite a bit um so I, I got one here to ask you guys. So, you know, art is always very subjective. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we all have very different tastes in many different things. So I'm going to pose it to each of you. Who is your favorite board game artist? Because there are so many different styles. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a very good question to kind of 
go into. So it gives our viewership a taste of who you are. What if, let's just say that you're a basic individual who judges each game. You don't really follow the name. Then John's off the like, channel. It's fine. I, I'm like, I like how this one looks. But I'm sure there's a game out there that like the art just is to well, you. I, I mean, I'm already talking about it. It was Mysterium. So, you know, it's I'm going to see who that guy is. I'm, I might, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Like maybe you haven't even taken the time yet to know who that person is, but you're finding them out, finding out right now on the show who's yep. the artist who has sold this great game for you. I love that. Four that... of them. <laughs> okay, cool. well. I, I just talked about Etherfields, and I, you know, since you're talking about it, I kind of looked up what else this artist has done. And there's some really good games that I, I love the art on. And it's definitely like on the darker style. This same artist did Nemesis, they did um, Tainted Grail. And oh, that's a, such a beautiful looking game. ISS Vanguard. Which is one I would love to get. Uh, Ella Labak, I think. Ella uh, Labak, basically. It's <laughs> the name of the artist. How about you, Peter? Well, so so this is going to be a little weird. Um, so I was, I was, I was actually doing research ahead of time for the episode, and I was like just scrolling through who are some really well known board game artists who are out there right now who are doing a lot of work. Um, and Oops, so, side note there, uh, just so your viewership knows, Peter's the only one that actually did the homework for this episode. So, <laughs> so, so I was I was going through there, and I actually found somebody whose art style I absolutely love, but I haven't played any of their games yet that they've illustrated for. Um, so uh, out of all the people that I think I was looking at, this is the one that stood out to me. Like, oh man, like I I could see this go this art in. Uh, again, I saw, I'm, again, I'm a librarian, so I'm like, this is art that I could have seen in a children's uh, picture book that would have been phenomenal. Um, and so it kind of made me start thinking about that. And that artist is Andrew Bosley, um, who did art for Everdell, um, did art for the Siege of Rundar, uh, which is a Reiner Knizia game, um, and, and, a, and a bunch of other ones, I think, at this point. And I love the art style, which now has sold me like I need to get these games to the table. I know the easiest one probably for me to get to the table would be Everdell. I actually have a copy of it at the library uh, that people can borrow. Um, and now I'm like, I, I want to go play this game so I can see more of this artist's work. Um, so besides having already mentioned that I love all Oliver Barrett's stuff in un, in the Unmatched series, that's the other one that really stood out to me during my researching for this episode. So Andrew Bosley, I'm coming for your games because I think you have amazing art. Yeah, he's he's definitely one of the more prolific and well known artists uh, right now. The other one that's really big and gets talked about all the time that for the most part I'm not a huge fan of is Vincent Dutrait. He tends to be on the more colorful style, a lot of happier stuff. He did role player. He did Robinson Crusoe. He actually did Quest for Eldorado, which I did talk about, but he's probably best known for things like Rising. Well, not maybe not best known, but he's also known for like, he did Rising Five Brune, room service he's done tons and tons of games and he seems to be everywhere you heard it from nathan if it's a happy art he's just not there he wants your dark and brooding people he wants your he wants your uh mork bork artwork he wants uh he wants all that dark stuff we talking like geiger dark i mean you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm not in, in, uh, who, there's no denial next? there. I, I was gonna say who was next. I talked about I talked about mine. Hey, hey you what? I got one here. Was, yeah. All right. So I looked at the, all four of the artists that were on there for Mysterium. Yeah. Three of them. All they done is Mysterium. But the fourth one here, 
Xavier Colette actually has done some other games that I have played. Oh, nice. Yeah, specifically Timeline. Oh. Which is like one of the, kind of like, you know, as far as like, you know, I have it on my shelf. Like I have a bunch because like I enjoy it. It's like nice light game, you know, kind of like closer on the day. But, you know, it's kind of like a whole, I was like, oh, you know, like trying to place everything. I don't I find that always, you know, fun to play. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it looks like he's done a lot of them. So John didn't even know it, but he had an artist who was probably his favorite. Well, well, I don't know, I don't know about that, but you know, he's also <laughs> done work on uh, seasons as well. Oh, there you go, nice. Yeah, so you know, well, that artist like also an... did Abyss, which is like the complete opposite <laughs> of <laughs> Mysterio. Yep, I, I saw that as well, and also did um, a game I haven't heard before, Obscurio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, it's a relatively new game. Yeah. But that that actually sounds like a pretty interesting game. Yeah, I was taking a look at that, and I was like, oh, well, you know, I think I might uh, check this out. I guess I probably should talk about mine. Um, um, yeah. So I am a huge, huge, huge fan of Final Frontier games and the artists that they use for quite a bit of their stuff. The Miko is probably one of my favorite artists there. I mean, he has done quite a bit. I was just going through his list of games that he has um done art for and what i currently have and or pre-ordered coming soon i have uh 12 things the token sesame that came out a little bit ago that's a token organizer they had a bunch of guest artists for little panels that you could put on it and he was one of the artists that they had on that one i was like well if i'm getting this i'm getting his art on there um it's a cartoony cartoon-esque kind of style and I really like it for what it is. I, I, I don't know what it is about it, but it just it makes me happy when I look at it. So to me, that's a good selling point. And, you know, I like the company itself. So having a real good artist that I enjoy with it just as an extra layer of awesomeness. And he's done some really fantastic games in there, like Raiders of the North Sea, all the West Kingdom stuff some fantastic games that he's done artwork for and we're going to have a bunch of endless winter coming on to the channel for unboxings and review he did a lot of the art for that too james is working hard on that so i don't have to do it and then i think the last thing that i was specifically wanted to mention was um newer artist somebody somebody who for me is is new that i just was introduced to through a game so i think this is another thing that we don't always think to do, but like, if you play a game and you like the art, take the time to Google that artist and see what else they have out there, even beyond the realm of board games. And so for me, the latest game that I played that when I played it, I had to go and find out more about the artist and what they do. Um, That artist is Sundara Tang, who uh, did the art for Flamecraft, which is the the new uh, artisan dragon board game where you're going around the village and you're upgrading all of the the shops and the the people and the dragons in the village work together to magically make their world a better place. Um, I loved this arts the, this art style that uh, they brought to the game. And then just had to go and like Google and check out the art station for Sundara Tang. And oh my gosh, have I fallen in love with this fantasy, this fantasy illustrator. So many great things, loving uh, their work. And so I even checked out on BGG, what are some other games uh, that they participated in? And so you've got Legacy of Dragon Holt. Um, you've got Descent Journeys in the Dark 2nd Edition, uh, which I know uh, James loves as well. Um, and so some other really great games, but again, outside of the game world, like go check out these artists and see what they're doing beyond the world of games. Um, because, you know, Flamecraft is one is one specific style that it looks like this artist does, but they do some really other great fantasy art out there as well. So uh, super excited by that to see what else they uh, what other projects they get tagged onto because Flamecraft has uh, 
kind of uh, become pretty well known at this point as even though for a newer game so i started to get the feeling that me and you peter are like polar opposites as far yep. as art taste absolutely <laughs> like, i see the cover for flamecraft yeah it does not it i had no interest in the game based on the cover yep yeah, we, I've, I've, yeah. Again, it's not dark at all. It's very family friendly looking. Uh, Nathan's like, nah, I'll pass. I'm good. Nathan's soul is hurting just hearing. This. <laughs> <laughs> but I have heard it's supposed to be a really good game, so I, I probably will try it at some point. But you yep. know, the cover just yeah, it's it's initially. it's an <laughs> it's an enjoyable game for sure. Um, well, yeah, I, I know taking... someone who would love that art, but yeah, it's kind of not for me mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I like it but i mean it's kind of not something that would draw me in now following along with what you said peter i just looked up one so one that mentioned that we just played uh wonderlands war mm-hmm. oh, look um, at that. <laughs> wonderland wars ah. uh, the artwork was done by uh manny trembley and i really i really enjoyed the artwork in that game and i was just looking up at some of the other stuff that he's done and there's some games that i have played in there that are done by him that i didn't even put together but some other games that i've wanted to play so he's done uh radlands and uh done work for dice thrones so like i've wanted to play dice thrones but there's just so much of it that i don't know where to jump into it but radlands i've not played but i've heard great fantastic things about it also no if we are talking about artists i think we should talk about ian o'toole now he's pro- not my necessarily my favorite artist, but he is a really good graphic designer, not as well as an artist. He is very good at, at laying out the art and making sure it's balanced well to make the game as playable as possible. And he is known for games like um, on Mars. He actually did a. a uh, and a lot of ga- the more heavier game like Lisboa, Pipeline, he did Age of Steam. He did Rococo, and I, which is a very different <laughs> approach than his normal stuff, but Rococo I think really looks nice. Ooh, I, I got one here too to mention, just to make James happy. Then we have to mention the artist of someone that did some of the art for a Game of Thrones, <laughs> the card game, oh. Eric M. Lang. Oh, really? Yeah, he is listed in there as an artist. Also for the others. So there you go, James. Eric M. Lang. Somebody ring the bell. I was going to say, I'm, I'm looking at uh, some more stuff by uh, that uh, the Ian O'Toole. Um, and one of them that I'm seeing is, uh, looks like he did some art for uh, Carnegie. Yep. Uh, which is a game that I've, you know, with my, you know, librarian connection here uh have been interested in actually learning more about that game i don't know i have know nothing about the style of play or anything like that but just knowing the theme of the game the topic of the game uh found that to be interesting and that cover on the box i actually like quite a bit so yeah a lot of people raving about the new game that he just uh did art for was a weather machine oh okay uh i want to get actually see the physical box art because the little bit i've seen of it you know it looks nice in the image but i got a feeling that the actual physical game will look so much better oh and peter you said about andrew bosley um liking that one uh merchants of the dark road which we were talking about earlier oh, uh, that. oh nice okay makes me even more excited to check that one out then wow okay so this one here is so I was looking at the the artist for Time Pirate because we were like, wow, you know, that one's really rough. Take a look at who that is. I'm going to tell you right now, you have played some of the games he's done art for. There's 500 over 500 games on the list. Uh, and I don't want to butcher this too much, but Franz. Bowinkle. That that's that would be how I would try that name as well. And oh my gosh, you're correct. One of one of tar- one of which Nathan mentioned just a little bit ago at the beginning of uh, 
at the beginning of the show with the quest for El Dorado. The yep. Targi, which is one of your favorites there, Peter. Targi's fantastic. I love, I love Targi. Also on Game of Thrones. Uh, Catan was another big one I remember seeing in there. All right. Robo Rally, which is a classic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about prolific. <laughs> yep. It seems to have worked on quite a lot. This feels like this was one of those that he completely forgot that it was due. <laughs> <laughs> or it was also, I think, maybe at the beginning, maybe they, maybe it was an intentional de- you know, decision too, because, you know, who knows? Maybe they paid for his likeness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm not like, because I just want to know like how many, because like, I've seen, you know, I think I saw Puerto Rico in there. Lords of so, Vegas. Uh, yeah, one of the Dominion expansions is listed in there. Lost Cities. I mean, that, that one there is like probably one of my favorite two player games. It's a good two player game. Nathan, you're muted. You're still muted. Nathan, you're muted. You're still muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I'll say, so maybe this might be a, a case of. Uh, uh, he's finishing up the art for this one game. I have five minutes till I have to start the next one. <laughs> Let's bang it yep. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mega Civilization. Oh, I've always wanted to play that. All right. Well, this is this has been a really fun conversation uh, about art in games, and and it went again in in some areas that I just didn't expect you know we went beyond just the illustrations uh that go out there but into the music that can be into maybe an app an app game to miniatures as well love miniatures so uh but again i think you know giving giving artists their due uh you know game designers absolutely very very important but great art can really uplift a game or even like nathan was talking make the game cohesive make it all tie together um and so uh, i think taking that time it's like you know sometimes it's like watching the credits at the end of a movie and being like you know you know it's, it's a long list of names but those people work on the game and and artists can can make and can break a game i mean i just recently got um actually so i don't know if you're all familiar with the the idea of the game basically i I will be uh making some uh i'll be making a statement about subjects that are maybe near and dear to your heart but thing is though i'll be saying something wrong in it and it could be very pedantic so i figured you know we'll just kind of go with um we'll do three of them and then we'll have a fourth as a tiebreaker if we need it um but basically everybody kind of gets a guess, you know, trying to identify what part of the statement I'm making is wrong. Um, and if, you know, if we need, and I'll, I'll, I'll go in like each one person will get to pick from three different topics, you know, as to what the, you know, the statement will be. Okay. Interesting. All right. So who would like to go first for picking the category? So uh, just before we continue, I just want to be clear and let everybody know that this is actually from the game, right? Yeah, this is actually from the game, um, actually. So if you think these questions are interesting, maybe you check out that game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, I might be uh, doing an opening for that one here. All right. <clears throat> so you what? We'll go with, uh, let's go with Nathan first here. Okay. All right. That's my nerd Here's- knowledge. Here's your, well, uh, basically this is out for everyone. So, you know, basically you can interrupt me at any time when you think you have identified what's wrong. Oh, let me, let me right. get my glasses in the right position so I can. Yes. So you can push them up. All right. But you'll get to pick the first category. So your choices are Star Wars, X-Men, or ALF. <laughs> Peter's going to jump in. Please don't choose ALF. Please don't choose ALF. Please, I, I, I really Choose thought about Elf. Elf just to make it hard for everybody, but I don't know much about Elf. <laughs> I know a little bit. Okay. 
I think I have to go with Star Wars. All right, give everybody give give everybody a, a shot. All right. <clears throat> uh, one of the most iconic buddy relationships of all time is that of Han Solo and his co-pilot Chewbacca. Chewbacca only speaks to Han in Shiruk, which, though he can understand English just fine, while Han only speaks to Chewbacca in English, as Shiruk is rough on human vocal cords. That's the statement. So which part of that do you guys think was wrong? I'm pretty sure Han at one point said something in shit. Not in English. I'm, I'm afraid that is not the answer that we're looking for. Uh, and Trappa says on this one, this is a mean-spirited question, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> Each one of the cards has like a little, like, has basically a picture of Mike Trapp on it. And <laughs> Can I could say I, another I guess? I can say it again? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, nobody else oh, is wait. kind of coming up. Um, um, actually, oh. I'm going to go with that. You said budding relationship, but the relationship has been a long-standing relationship due to the fact of Chewbacca having a life debt with Han Solo. That's Did you say- while that could be arguable, um, that's not what we're looking for here. I mean, it kind of depends upon how you define budding. I mean, it's it's kind of also within you know movie context. I mean, um, I'm afraid that's not what we're looking for here. Yeah, I, that's I, where I, I was going to go. I say <laughs> that you were wrong, and I am right. Well, you are more than happy to have that opinion. Can, All right. Do, are we okay with him reading it one more time? Yeah, I can read it one more time here for you. All right. One of the most iconic buddy relationships. It's not budding. It's buddy oh, it's relationships. Buddy, buddy relationships. Oh, that's okay. what I thought. Is that buddy? All right. Buddy relationships of all time is that of Han Solo and his co-pilot Chewbacca. Chewbacca only speaks to Han and Shiruk though he can understand English just fine, while Han only speaks to Chewbacca in English, as Shiruk is rough on human vocal cords. So in the statement, it says he only speaks to Han in this language. He speaks to everybody in that language. If, if I mean, technically, um, actually, technically, he speaks to yeah. everyone uh, in that language. Han yeah, is just I, the one who understands it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, come. I mean, that's not what they're so, looking for. I'm sure. I mean, but. you're skirting around in the territory, but you're not really. So, so the only other one that I'm going to come up with on that one is they keep on referring to it as in English, and I don't think that that is actually the language that they're technically speaking. It's right. galactic common, I believe. That that is what we were looking for. Galactic oh. common is what they're actually speaking, not English. Oh. <laughs> nice. Well done, Evan. Well done. I was, I was like, man, I know this one. Why? Why does it take it so long? All right. There's That's a point hilarious. for Evan. That's funny. Oh, yeah. I should have known that. But did he take <laughs> I, No, I will be, they, I will be completely honest. Twice in there. I will be completely honest. I've been, I have watched Star Wars, the movies, for years since I was a kid. I've never once heard the term galactic common. First time ever, right now. I, I may have read a lot of the books. I did not read the books at all. Too. Well, <laughs> here you should play the no. RPG because they refer to it as Galactic Common. Now oh, there you go. Now, if is this like the show, and technically you have to say um actually for the <laughs> point to count. I mean, I I didn't say that we had to do that at the beginning of True. this, but Evan but, definitely gets a point. But yeah, going forward, you have to say um actually. We'll we'll, we'll add that in there too. Why not? <laughs> yeah, if you don't proceed the in your answer with um actually. All right, Evan. Evan got it right, so Evan gets to choose yep. maybe the next one. Yep, Evan gets to choose the next one. Oh, uh, right, give me Alf. <laughs> nope, actually, uh, I'm giving you a different set of three. So it's, it's completely different, you know, every time here. So your choices are Naruto, Legend of Zelda, or Chronicles of Narnia. Well, Chronicles of Narnia would be unfair to <laughs> probably Peter. It's the only one of those three I know. <laughs> so we're going to go with Legend of Zelda. All right. The 1986 video game series. The primary antagonist of the franchise, Ganondorf, is a member of the Gerudo race, who are thieves and tricksters from the desert. Trained by his father in the ways of magic, 
Ganondorf often possesses the Triforce of Power, making him nearly invincible. That entire statement made no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... I, I know exactly what's wrong right off the bat. And I don't even need the... I know, I, I know. I know Link and Zelda and Ocarina. And that is it. That's all I know. This is another one of the ones that, that would be my my wheelhouse. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to... Let's just say that I may have a section of my wall art is dedicated to Legend of Zelda. Nice. We can. Nathan seems like he might have something going he might Maybe. have it. He might have an um actually for you. Yep. I think I have to have it repeated though. Okay. All right. I'll I'll give it one more time here. The primary antagonist of the franchise, Ganondorf, is a member of the Gerudo race, who are thieves and tricksters from the desert. Trained by his father in the ways of magic, Ganondorf often possesses the Triforce of Power, making him nearly invincible. Um, actually. Is it the Gerudos are the ones in the volcanoes? The ones that live in the desert are different group? No, that's the Gorons that you're thinking of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, the Gerudo do live in the desert. Uh, any, I played any one other? Zelda game. I mean, I've I've played all of them. I haven't played one since Ocarina of Time, so... That's the one I played, so... <laughs> well, if um, you played Ocarina of Time, then you if you've played at least to there, you have all the information you know, you need. I, I the last this. time I played Ocarina of Time <laughs> was probably, like, In fact, when it first came out. Ocarina of Time is where a lot of the lore is established that this, that this um actually is about. I don't know if I can give you any more of a hint without giving it. <laughs> Peter's got it. Look at him. He's he's yeah. All right. I think we're gonna have to call that one. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to call that one. I don't think anybody's right. getting this one. So Ganondorf didn't have a father. The Gerudo race is primarily females, but like once every thousand years, a male is born and they automatically become the thief king because of their rarity. All right. Yeah, okay. I, I vaguely remember that. Now. Nope. <laughs> yep. See, that, that's not even printed on the card. I just know that. Actually, oh, I, actually, I guess that is on here. Except for every hundred years. Oh, I was wrong. It's a hundred years, not a thousand. Yep. Raw deal for the ladies yet again is what Mike Trap says. <laughs> okay. All right, Peter. You get to pick the, the the third one here. All right. All right. Your choices are X Men. Mystery Science Theater 3000 or Harry Potter? No, Harry Potter. It's the only oh. thing I'm... <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. It's my, oh, Mystery my... Science Theater I... 3000. Nope. nope, my turn to choose something I might know. All right. <laughs> the position of Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher... All right, let me try that. The position of Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts seems to be cursed. Of the seven professors that held that position in the books... All of them, including I don't know anything about Harry Potter. Queerness Quirrell, Gilderoy Lockhart, Remus Lupin, Alstor Mad Eye Moody, Dolores Umbridge, Severus Snape, and Amicus Caro served only one year. Um, actually, Alistair Moody technically wasn't the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, as in it was, um, oh, what was his name? What was his name? Come on, you can do it. I, I, I have it in there. It's there. Um, uh, I can't think of his name. All right. You've got the point, unless somebody can give me the name of who was actually. Because you got it right. Moody did not teach Defense Against the Dark Arts. If somebody can give me the exact name of who it was. No. Nope. All right. It was uh, Barty Couch Jr. 
under the effect That's of it. a polyjuice potion. I couldn't think of his name either. Uh, it was there. I, yep. I knew it was Junior, and I was right. like, oh, if I could just think of his name. This one here, I'd it. have no clue on. I've been like, nope, I know nothing. There's a weird that people keep acting like the guy in the fourth book was Mad Eye. It wasn't. It was a yep. crazy dude doing a mean impression of him. <laughs> yep. Good job, Evan. All right. I, I was well, I was I was stuck on the the number of teachers. I was like, oh gosh, were, were there actually seven? So, but yeah. All right. Well, we don't need the tiebreaker, but I really no. wanted to ask this one anyway because it's like three really good subjects. I, I feel like it was just well. Then you get to choose the subject. Yeah. After you read which three you want, which three All right. are it's Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings, ooh ooh, or Frankenstein. All three of those, so good. Interesting. All right, which one are you going to go with? I feel like Dungeons and Dragons is the one to, to end on here. Okay. Monopoly it is. Yep, Monopoly it is. Simple. The Demon Princess of the Abyss are some of the most formidable foes in the universe. Fraz Uberlu is the Prince of Deception and Delusions who appears as a massive gargoyle. Grogar is the Prince of Cruelty who appears as a demonic goat wearing a bell and rules the realm of Tambalin. And Grazd is the dark prince of pleasure, who appears as a beautiful but demonic humanoid and takes advantage of others through manipulation and charm. I would not get this one. I mean, I'm the resident D&D guy, but I, I don't do super lore stuff so I, I play i play the game and i run a and i run a game but i don't worry about you super big lore stuff so i, I usually play the car i just mm-hmm. play the car. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i you know i might have run a campaign you know for mm-hmm. a few years but it was my own campaign setting i didn't have to worry about somebody else's lore same all right uh, so it sounds like nobody's going to get that one. No. Nope. Grogar is not one of the demon princes of the abyss. Grogar is actually the villain of a, of the My Little Pony series. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I'm actually glad I couldn't get that. <laughs> yep. I like it. <laughs> All right. Evan. Evan's the big winner. Yep. Evan's the winner. Take well home. done. Yep, Everybody, and- thank you for watching. Yeah. Yep. If you fun. have any, if you have any favorite uh, artists for board games, put them in the comments of the video. Let us know who you like, uh, and we will go check out their stuff and hopefully play their games. Yeah, or, or who you might have never knew that you know was somebody, yeah. and then you're like, oh hey, they made all these other games, right? Or, or just tell us why we're wrong with our art choices. We're okay with go. that too. Yeah, tell us why we should have picked all anime artists. Ha, ha, ha.